thanks for sitting down with me today, Brad. Just wanted to get some background information about uh, whole movement and the work that you're doing. Just exactly how did you get started uh, folding paper circles? Well, I got started after 10 years of exploring geometry really comprehensively because I wanted to know something about the patterns of movement in space, how things worked, why some patterns generate and other patterns dissipate, dead end. So after 10 years of exploring the geometry, I realized that all the patterns that we understand in geometry and mathematics, the patterns that we observe in nature that we use in art and we see in biology, chemistry, all of the disciplines um, were the same patterns, different forms. And all those patterns seemed to be within the sphere, which was whole. Through the movement of folding, I'm getting all of the, the functions that we describe mathematically. So it was at that point that I said, this seems important to do. 17 years ago, and I'm still folding paper plates. So has it taken the place of your art, your sculpture, or is it added to it? Um, it's clearly adding to it, but it's, it's changed how I relate to it. So what is your goal now? What is your goal with whole movement? Well, now I'm really not so concerned with the product. I mean, as a sculptor, you're concerned with product. And, uh, well, the process is just a way of getting that product. And now I've just reversed that. The product is, is endless, so I'm not concerned with that. Um, I'm, con I'm interested in the process. So what is the process of whole movement? Whole movement. <laughs> Moving of the whole. And there is no other shape or form that demonstrates that concept. Because everything is, is, we put pieces and parts together. We're constructing. This is not a construction process. It's going in and observing the relationships that develop out of simply the circle folding to itself. The process, being distinct from the principles, would be observation, reflection, modeling, comparing, observing, reflecting, thinking about it, modeling, comparing, who will benefit from exploring folding of the circle? My target audience is anybody that's interested, for whatever their reasons are. Some people will fold like they do origami because it's a fun thing to do, it's an activity, it's a challenge. Um, other people will fold for the information, other people will do it because, gee, we don't do that. Nobody's ever done that. Looks interesting. Anybody that deals with patterns, I mean, this really is about the formation um, and development of pattern. So the more, the more we understand pattern, the more we're able to recognize pattern, the more informative we become about our lives and what's going on around us. What would your sense be about uh, younger children using this and the benefits that they might get from it? Well, the benefits are that they're right away they're dealing with pattern directly through their own experience of folding, they're, even though they may not even talk about the information that's generated and with younger children, uh, I don't go into that much. A lot of times they'll discover uh, Pythagorean theorem and we don't talk about it and I don't tell them what it is. They don't need to know that at that point. They just need the experience and the process. And so what I, the youngest child I've worked with is four years old. And I've had teachers tell me they've worked with their three-year-olds folding circles. So it really is, the only thing I can come up with is if you can fold a circle in half, you're able to do it. Right. And if you're able to fold it in half, you can certainly talk about it and what you observe and whatever language vocabulary you have. So how much math background had you had before you got started with your exploration of geometry? The circle, nothing. I have no math background, which allows me to move into this in a way that if I had a math background, I couldn't do because mathematical parameters are pretty set. So whose work mathematically has been helpful to you? I don't. I just take in mathematically what I come across, things that are of interest, and then try and look at the circle and say, okay, where is that located within the movement of the circle? 
do you see connections in the work that you're doing mathematically with uh, any trends or research that's going on currently? Well, I say, sure, there's a lot of connections. I mean, one, um, Fermat's theory or theorem about, you know, whether you can a squared plus b squared equals c squared. Now, can you take that uh, integer to a higher power? And there's, you know, a lot of debate about that. Nobody's really proven that you can. Well, when you're folding the circle and you locate the right angle triangle within the rhomboid, within the circle, uh, it's very clear that you cannot because a to itself is a to itself a squared. It's not a three times, four times, or five times. Right. So somebody may figure out a way to make it work with numbers, but it certainly doesn't work with a circle. So what kind of work do you do on a regular basis uh, besides uh, this video and some of the books you've written? What other ways do you explore whole movement? A lot of the exploration I've done has come through the work in schools with children. So for the last 17 years, as I've been exploring the circle, I've had the opportunity of going in and out of schools continually during that time, from first grade level on up. And so a lot of what I discovered I throw into the classroom, see how kids respond. Uh, I get to check out different ways of presentation, what works, what doesn't work. And during that, um, I get a lot of information back about what kids will observe, what they see in the circle that I don't, that I've missed. In the same way that mathematicians will have to translate what they're seeing into mathematical formulation before it really makes sense to them. And so that gives me a chance you know, to look in the window of mathematics and to see a little bit how it functions. What kind of uh, reaction do you have to the, the schools that you're going into as far as their math education? How does whole movement fit into what they're doing? It doesn't really fit in. And I get this question a lot from teachers and parents. How does this fit with the curriculum? It is the curriculum because it's whole. You're not adding or taking anything away. Everything is in the circle. What about uh, parents that are homeschooling? How can they utilize whole movement? Well, in the same way. Um, what works really well in a homeschooling situation is when you've got uh, different age level siblings. So you might have three, four, five-year-olds. You might have 16 or 17-year-olds and a few in between. So as soon as somebody gets interested in folding the circle and they start folding, the younger kids move right into it because they're in the habit of following what their older siblings do, getting interested, they want to do it too. Um, what I find interesting is it also begins to incorporate the parents because a lot of the patterns and the forms that we generate in the folding of the circle are things that they're familiar with, either in their professional life or just generally. And so all of a sudden they're making connections to something that's totally unfamiliar. That gets them interested. So then we've got the whole family exploring what the circle is. So how is this different than origami? Origami starts with a square. Well, the, the word origami means to fold paper. So on, on that level, we're doing exactly the same thing. We're folding paper. The difference is that the square is only part of a circle. So when you're folding a square, you're limited to four sides. As much as you can do with it, there's a limit. Um, when you look at an inscribed circle, or an inscribed square in the circle, you have two diameters. Those are your diagonals to the square. How many diameters does a circle have? It's endless. And in, to my experience, my way of thinking, that's the difference. What do you hope to accomplish with this video? There's the opportunity for more people to be able to see, at least get a sense of what I'm doing. Because what's in this video is not, I mean, it's just a step in the door. It's a small part. It gives you a sense of one, the sequential development of information and how it's all interrelated. That, you know, to make different polyhedron, we're not cutting out, measuring, and putting pieces together. It all just unfolds from the circle. 
when we're using multiple circles, that's just what nature does. It never makes one of anything and stops. It makes one of something and then it duplicates exactly the same thing again and again and again. And then it starts playing with all the various combinations of how they go together. You know, you, you, you start, with, um, start with an atom and, and you build up to, you know, a molecule and then you go to a compound and, you know, pretty soon you've got a table, a chair. The reality is the spherical movement. Why do you suppose it's taken this long for people to begin to explore folding circles? I think a lot of it is that we're just caught in the words we use. When we draw a picture of a circle, we don't say, I drew a picture of a circle or an image or a symbol. So I drew a circle. Don't need to question it anymore. It's a circle. We all know that. But in fact, it's not a circle. See? But the thinking because of the words we use to describe. And most words are, are simply a description of. It's, it's like when we describe, what is a circle? How would you define a circle? Okay, most, most kids will say it's round. Most mathematicians will give you something to the effect of you've got a point in movement equidistant around center point or some such. That simply describes the function of a compass. That doesn't describe a circle. That describes the tool they use to make the circle. Um, the circle, in fact, has no center. That's the reality of the circle. There's no center. Now, that seems totally counter to everything we know about a circle because we start with the center and then inscribe the circumference. When you think about concentric circles, you know, from that center point, you just to get bigger and bigger and bigger endlessly. Doesn't, scale has nothing to do with it. Well, movement is in a minimum of two directions. It's never one directional. So if you've got a movement infinitely out, that boundary moves infinitely out, that boundary also moves infinitely in. So there is no center to the circle. That's the reality. But the center is, is an important concept. It's a useful tool. It's necessary in a lot of cases. So we just automatically assume that's what a circle is, it has a center, it's part of the description. And I have to question that because my experience is different. When I fold circles, it doesn't have a difference until I've got three diameters in there crossing at the, at the center location. That's only a location, it's not the center point. How do mathematicians respond to your work? What kind of reactions have you gotten from the math community? From my experience with individual math people that I've, that I've either worked with or talked with, um, it ranges everything from, this is great, I never thought of it, excitement, look at this, it's a whole other way of moving into mathematics and understanding some of the stuff. You know, with teachers, when we do some folding and we fold the tetrahedron, then we open it up and we look at what shapes do we have, what's been generated, we look at the right angle triangles, we look at the Pythagorean theorem, and then we discover it through talking about relationship of parts. And they go, oh, that's what it means. It's that simple. Yeah. See, there's a lot that the circle offers experientially that gives us an understanding that we don't get when we just learn a formula. We don't know what the formula, where it came from, what it means. So I've had everything from that total openness to embrace whatever folding circles is about to mathematicians that were very threatened and would ask me a few questions and then just like, you're wrong, they're out of there. Well, why, why do you suppose? What, what do you think the um, issue is for those that um, don't embrace it? Well, when your whole career, professional career is wrapped up as say a university math professor, that's what becomes meaningful and important. And if, if you're an insecure individual, you're going to feel threatened when somebody comes along and says, hey, that's not all there is to it. You missed a whole bunch of stuff. Well, how do you think whole movement can change the way mathematics is or geometry is taught? I have no idea. I don't know. My job at this point is, is to explore and get as much information out of it as I can, make some kind of documentation of that, 
and hopefully get enough people interested that we begin to fold circles, at least as much as we draw circles. And then what people do with that, it's up to them. I mean, it's, it's like, I feel like I'm developing a tool. I don't know how to use it. You know, that's, that's for my grandkids to figure out. Yeah, I've noticed a lot of your forms, especially recently, uh, seem more natural. What is that about? Simply because having spent a lot of years, you know, working with the polyhedra, um, I mean, you can work endlessly with that, variations, and just, you know, every time you, you make a change, it changes the relationship to everything else, and then you're off into another symmetry or another reformation. Um, at some point, okay, I got that. I know that's what happens. I know basically how it works. Now, what else does it do? Now, given that geometry is a generalization about what we observe in nature, the circle gives us the opportunity to actually model the forms and not just make a generalization. Do you see certain formations in nature that you can recognize? Oh, yeah. Own? When I first started working with geometry, having spent most of my life professionally as a sculptor, I thought I could hold a lot of patterns in my head at the same time. You know, I mean, as you're working, you're working with layers and layers of pattern, forming them in different ways. And um, as soon as I got into geometry and got rid of the, the, um, the images, the aesthetics and all that stuff and started looking at the process, I realized I knew very little about spatial patterns and I really was not very sophisticated in terms of what I could retain in my head at the same time. Is there something that we can learn from the circle that somehow has a correlation with our own structure, our own patterns? Um, yeah, one of the most obvious things that came up fairly early on is in, in making a, a tetrahelix, which is a whole bunch of tetrahedrons joined face to face, creating a helix form. And then I decided, okay, that's kind of interesting, and it does a lot of interesting things, particularly when you hinge it. Um, I made a two frequency tetrahedron so you could see the internal octahedron as a space to see how that moved through. And what I found interesting is that. When you string the axes of that octahedron space, it's giving you, again, three, basically three diameters. It's your three axes, and they're at right angles. So when you string that in each one of those, what you're getting is the DNA double helix, which, again, goes back to that ratio of one to two. You've got one half in, in each octahedron. You've got one half of three diameters. And then when they connect up, they connect up into what we have identified as the DNA double helix ladder. Now, the interesting thing is that it's going at an opposite spin than the tetrahelix, which is going the other way. So the context for the DNA, which is the information carrier of all of who we are, what we are, an accumulation of all of that, is tetrahedral. Now, you mentioned, the, you mentioned the ovum during the um, DVD. I wonder if you could elaborate on, on that. So we have a single ovum. It's fertilized, it's ready to grow. Okay, it can only generate the wholeness of what it is. So inside we get all this information beginning to divide up into pairs and the outer cell is still whole. It just squeezes in and becomes a duality, each containing replicas of the other, with slight variations, which makes the difference in human beings. Um, this can only generate the wholeness of what it is. This is conceptually what we do. One, two, three. This is not what nature does. The old biology books said, well, it duplicates itself, so this is what it does. One, two, three, four. But since we've been able to get a little tube and camera down in there and take a look and actually see what happens, is what happens, it goes from one, quickly goes into two, boom. That's what it does. There's been no separation. It's just divided itself. This is a tetrahedron, this closest packing of spheres. Why does it do this? Why doesn't it go into four? Because four is about formation. 
you know, if we if we if we do on a flat surface. So it goes into four in a tetrahedral pattern because one, it's still singular, it's still whole, no separation, and two, it's the strongest. Um, arrangement of spheres that exist. So what happens then is then we have a separation. One of these cells is actually going to separate from the others. Then it, that allows it to go into 8, 16, 32, and then, you know, when it gets into the hundreds of millions, it's already dividing up into different functions and different forms and various systems. But they're all interrelated because that's where they all are. So tell me about the role of observation in whole movement. Where does that come into play? Observation is, is a really critical aspect of it. When we're a baby, we don't know anything about where we've come out into. The only thing we really have to go on is what we see. And then in whatever rudimentary ways we have at that point, thinking about making connections of what we see cause and effect comes into that. When you do this, what happens? You observe the relationship between the things. It's about observation. You know, and there are what I term principles, seven principles. And they're simply qualities of description of what happens when you fold the circle in half. What are those seven principles? Whole, movement, division, duality, triangulation, consistency, interdependent. And it is only, it is through the consistency that allows the interdependency that directs the interrelationship between the parts. To me, one of the most important aspects of what whole movement is about is that it's looking at the whole. It's not looking at parts. Parts are just a reformation of the whole in multiplicity. The best definition of wholeness that I've heard came from a nine-year-old boy in a library workshop one Saturday afternoon. And I was talking about wholeness, and I said, hey, you guys don't know what I'm talking about when I say whole, do you? And I says, no. Okay, let's talk about it. So I said, it's, what does it mean? Complete. Everything's in it. You know. Um, and so they started giving examples. Well, my whole family, that's whole. Uh, you know, my whole house. He says, come on, we've got to get bigger because those are just parts. So we got up to the whole universe. And so one, one kid wasn't participating at all. I says, well, what about you? What have you been thinking about? He says, well, I think that it's something, but you can't add anything to it or take anything away from it. And I said, well, that works for me. That's whole. It's everything we know, everything we will ever know, and, and even more stuff we will never know because there's more in this universe than what we perceive. Every mathematical equation is based on the unknown, what we don't know. We've got to consider that far more because that's part of the whole. I mean, that's what X is. You know, A plus B equals C, or A plus B um, equals X. What is X? It's, well, we don't know. It could be anything. So we've got to leave ourselves open for anything.